but um, our staff who've all worked so very hard on this program, our planning committee, Mark Johnson in our office, Barbara Giles, she's the person you see outside to fill out your little slips for the door prizes, Joe Zapata, and from the VA, Elizabeth Packer, Veronica Salazar and Tressa Carr. And in the back of the room, we have a stream team. This conference and tomorrow's conference are being streamed live on the internet um, to other folks who are listening in who couldn't be here. And that, that's, uh, that team's led by Bob Merrill. And back there with him as well are John Munoz and Kelvin Buchanan. So um, thanks to them. And um, do you want to? Yes, so we're there. Okay. So, oh, so not yet. Okay, well, I'm, uh, Dr. Oaks has already been uh, introduced, so I will introduce Dr. Parker. Dr. Robert Parker is board certified in geriatrics. He's got more than 25 years of experience in the clinical practice of geriatrics. He's the chief of the division of geriatrics, which is the division, division which runs the hospital acute care for the elderly, and that's what we're going to hear about, ACE. So please welcome Dr. Oaks for right now. Uh, thank you again. So we're going to be uh, using the hour in two segments. The first 30 minutes is an overview of what the ACE model is. And the second half is much more focused into telling our own little story, uh, some of the quality improvement projects, and talking to you about how we do things, and hopefully having some little time for questions from the audience. So the uh, acute care of elderly unit has multiple team members, and this slide just have some of the team members. We have a tremendous list of the nurses that work every day in our unit, or social worker or case managers, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge them because they, this is a result of a huge um, uh, team component. What we're going to be reviewing in the first 30 minutes cover uh, the definition of the ACE unit, what are the challenges that we're facing in the world, in the United States, and specifically in Texas, the evidence behind having uh, ACE models of care, and in the second half, uh, talking about the outcomes and the quality improvement and how the ACE model becomes a laboratory of quality improvement um, uh, for uh, better outcomes in older adults. Um, the first thing is let us look into our current reality and some of the challenges that we have. A scenario is like an 85-year-old Fred Elder coming to the emergency department, come with acute mental status changes, and it takes 10 hours to be admitted to the floor. What's wrong there? Raise your hand if you want it to be 10 hours in a stretcher that is really thin, and by the time that you get up, you don't have acute mental status changes, but pressure sores, and maybe you already fell, and you have been restrained to an issue. 90-year-old admitted to the hospital for the third time in 30 days, mm -hmm. right? What, what's going on there? 83-year-old discharged from hospital arrives to the skill on Friday evening without a discharge summary. Sounds familiar? Nobody talk among the uh, healthcare systems. There is not a paperwork, and the lady, the family is not with her, but we are expected to provide really good care. 73-year-old demented male is admitted, no family available, very combative, how you will handle that? So all of these questions currently are bringing a great opportunity to rethink how we provide care for older adults. And that's what the ACE model came in the 1980s under uh, Robert uh, Palmer, Bob Palmer and Dr. Lansfield in California, really rethinking, can we do a better job with these complicated older adults? Can we initiate dialogue among all the transitions of care and develop processes that can address those poor stories and hopefully create a safety net for them? So the ACE, even though it's called an ACE unit, I want that you start thinking about an ACE model because ACEs shouldn't be exclusive, beautiful places where people go. It should be the way that we care for people and seniors regardless of a unit. So the model of care has several components. One is a center nursing of excellence. I wanted that you read it again. Nursing excellence. It's not a great place where doctors dominate. It's not a great place where um, a specialty dominates. It's a nursing center 
where the model of working shoulder to shoulder is vital in the process. So we are seeing everybody as an equal, an empowerment from the housekeeper to the CEO. It's a change in the way that we do business for older adults. Their sickness and their well-being is a business for everyone. And, and that's a model, it's not a unit. There is a team approach. So what you will see that is common on ACES is people talk. But they don't talk three days after somebody had a bad event. They don't talk the date of the discharge. We talk from the day that the patient gets admitted in a team meeting daily where we have between 10 up to 20 uh, uh, interprofessional team members from all disciplines, including chaplaincy, because human beings have a spiritual component. We have social workers, case managers. We have the nurses, the dogs, the PTs, and OTs, and we have sometimes the CNAs, and we have a restorative aid who I'm going to describe a little bit more as one of the champions and assets in contributing to the care of these older adults. We have a pharmacist that review the medications, that brings evidence, that can say uh, we're duplicating efforts, we are uh, not adjusting the medication to the renal clearance, and we have, of course, a geriatrician that helps and promotes um, the, the geriatric concepts around these patients. So what you're seeing is everything that is so intuitive, but we unfortunately are not doing. So we're inviting today to you is not only to learn from this, but see where you are, what setting you are working on, and in what level you should start developing an ACE model. Your nursing homes, a home health agency. Some of you are much more team oriented if you work in rehab units. Many of you are used to team approaches. But why to do this only once a week, or once a month, or when the patient gets in trouble? What about if we do it daily? If everybody is trained in geriatric principles, which is another major component, these didn't come just by telling people we're going to be doing what we're supposed to do. We require intense training. So ACE units invest in education to geriatricize every person in the team. Sometimes we see very good nurses doing good things such as, well, I thought the patient was agitated. I needed to restrain it. I was really busy. This is the choice I did and really work in a non-threatening way to go over and review why the patient could have been avoided and restrained. What are the things necessary to support that nurse to really avoid a restraint? And then suddenly you're talking about processes. And then suddenly you're talking about resources. So what it seems to be so medical is actually a much more complex process that we will you know, be telling you in detail in uh, the second half of the talk. So why we need more ACE units and ACE models? Because we don't have many in Texas. Our ACE unit is located currently in the medical center area in Cristo Santa Rosa Hospital. But the only two ACEs in Texas are one in Galveston, who needed to downgrade beds because the hurricane, unfortunately, and a little small unit in St. Luke's in Houston. So we are serving for the first time as the first ACE model in the South Texas. We have an ACE program that we initiated also in San Antonio in the Nix Hospital, and university is looking into expanding this concept. So another pearl from this talk is an ACE is not an exclusive model that belongs to a hospital. It should be the care that we should be promoting everywhere. I want my unit being the best, but it's okay to have others. It's okay. Um, we need to have expertise. So everybody right now is talking about pediatrics, which is a huge need in San Antonio. Have you read the news, right? Everybody, freestanding hospital. Well, I, I love to have good care for children. The reality and the demographics is who is taking care of our seniors and who is looking systematically and avoiding errors and looking systematically in patients' outcomes that benefit seniors. So I think there is a great opportunity, and we are doing that with the partnership with Cristo Santa Rosa and the school. Let us look uh, systematically and spread the model. They have 40-something hospitals, so we wanted to have this model across Texas, Mexico, Louisiana, Oklahoma, where they care, like in Wisconsin, they have 42 programs right now with ACEs. And uh, they do also e-geriatrician. They communicate long distance with rural areas where they have trained the patient, the, the teams, 
And a geriatrician make a phone call, they use electronic medical records, so the geriatrician can see in real time the ACE tracker, which I'm going to show you to you in a second, and make recommendations even though you are not present physically. In other words, can we be innovative? If some of you come from rural areas and you don't have geriatrician, can you build a model that can help seniors and get expertise? Well, we're here to be consultants for you. We're interested in helping others to move this uh, model across uh, you know, San Antonio and Texas and beyond. This is a very famous slide. Are you familiar with that, anybody that is not? So everybody probably, you saw it already in one of the talks. I just wanted to point out, uh, we're here in this segment of the population, your octogenarians are massive right now. For the first time in history, we have the largest number of centenarians alive and living longer. Multiple surgeries, multiple comorbidities, frailty. So we have a tremendous challenge there. This is just to say that the large group that we are going to be facing in Texas is going to be your seniors. And Texas will be having two challenges. One, diversity. Largest, uh, one of the largest states with Mexican Americans in the country. We will be in 2020 close to 60% Mexican American. Mexican Americans have very interesting challenges. Some of them are not, unfortunately, very nice. Low literacy rates, the highest percentage of high schoolers dropping out of high school are Hispanics, 52%. San Antonio and the West Side uh, have 30% of women being single moms. Largest in the country pregnancies under, age of, under the age of 13, a pediatrician told me two weeks ago. And we have all of those households living multi-generationally. And uh, many of them already poverty, taking care of all the older ones. There is data showing our Mexican-Americans um, are being diagnosed with dementia too late. Why? Because culturally, they think dementia is normal part of aging, and they only are bringing the older adults when they are having behavioral problems, which is into four or five years into the dementia process. And this is probably one of the most difficult challenges. Hispanics develop dementia seven years younger than their counterparts, blacks or uh, uh, whites. We think it's because the massive obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and those challenges are huge. It's not only just let us take care of these older adults, it's literacy issues, navigating a system, reading labels. So we are not moving as fast as we should to address those issues in Texas. And I think the ACE unit is promoting some of that research and quality improvement and acknowledging those challenges and see how we can become more culturally competent to deal with those. This was covered part in the false talk. An ACE unit is also a, a laboratory where patient safety is in the head of everyone. What other processes can we do so we don't wait until a bad outcome comes? Um, we don't have a lot of geriatricians, so we are really interested in empowering teams, empowering our nursing staff, empowering our pharmacists, or OTs, PTs, social workers, chaplaincy, to really address the complexity of these older adults and giving uh, geriatric principles that can, be, uh, uh, that can be given and provided effectively for the patients and their families and, 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 and their well-being. The other uh, component is we're working more with hospitalists. So any of you are still physicians, seeing patients in the hospital, in the nursing home, in the clinics? Very few. Many of our physicians cannot do the three of them. So more and more we need to be innovative about how we work with our hospitalists. So the ACE unit partner with the hospitalists, with the surgeons. The surgeons can admit their patients and come to the meetings. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. The hospitalists are welcome to come to the meeting. So it's a change in culture for everybody. And finding that those meetings can provide, in one hour or 30 minutes, can give them a lot of answers because you're meeting with the entire team. Some other uh, hospitals are doing huddles in the morning, transplant units, specialized clinics, review the entire patients coming, what are the issues that they will foresee. And um, uh, well met in, in town, develop weekly meetings where they track what patients were hospitalized, 
what patients are moving into a trajectory of palliative care. So what, there are multiple models that you could look, but in the hospital, I think one of the, the greatest assets is to have an ACE model because it really centralizes and focuses in wonderful um, uh, opportunities to provide outstanding care. This is what also has been a big turmoil in understanding the systems promoting more quality improvement. Almost one fifth of the 12 million Medicare recipients that were reviewed in, in, in 2003 were readmitted in 30 days. So if you are in one of the systems of care, everybody is looking into how we address this. Why, why? Before we were not looking into it. Well, Medicare was paying for every single admission, right? So if you get sick 10 times, 10 times you get paid. Now we're looking into what is so intuitive. Let us look into quality. If I am going to choose where I'm going to get my hip replaced, people and the customers and the expectations are look into infection rates. What are the patient satisfactions in that hospital? How many people fall in your hospital? How many psychotropics do you give people if you are agitated? I think all or, or, or population and also changing and learning those questions. And it used to be that a pretty hospital was what you needed to have. Not anymore. We need to be able to show our numbers. And what are we doing to address those things? And the 30 day is one of the biggest issues and Dr. Parker will be talking and the other complementary talk about Interact, which is a program addressing the readmission rate from the nursing home perspective. Um, but again, it, it's good to question when we have older adults and they return to our hospital, we look into that. And we try to speak with our partners in finding out what went wrong. And sometimes it's very complex because you could do a very good job at the ACE, but if your partners in the community or in your transitions of care do not have processes, then you start fa uh, failing. So it's in our own interest to educate and partner with our long-term care continuum because we know the complexity of these older adults are beyond the hospital or beyond the nursing home. And Dr. Parker will give you specific examples and a specific tools that have been useful in our group. From the same article, Dr. Janks found that 50% was no follow-up between the hospital and the readmission. So if you have a patient with dementia, they got admitted, they got pneumonia, they get discharged in delirium, the medications were not explained well, the family maybe couldn't afford them, nobody really checked very quickly and verifying if the patients were taking the medication. So what happened, the older adult got sick and they get readmitted. So we are very intentional in tracking readmission rates. And one of my geriatric fellows that graduated from the quality improvement course here in San Antonio look into that. And by making some changes that we did in the ACE unit, our follow-up currently is 80% in the first 72 hours. Why? We did a few things. Giving them a discharge summary and be sure they live with a phone number that they can call and an appointment. Versus, oh, you have delirium, dementia, good luck, you need to call your doctor. We, we don't do that anymore. Why? Because patients are going to lose the paper, they're not going to know, so they leave with an appointment. Simple things that you could do in your systems that work appropriately, and we were able to, to, to have that data available. This is an old picture, this is in our all ACE unit, just to show you some of the members of the team, but you have in that slide around uh, four to five different disciplines together. Uh, we have fun. It's really good when you meet every day and you just discuss the case and then there is humor but there is also this intention to um, learn something and mistakes are allowable and if somebody did something, it's an opportunity to retain the process and it's not about the individual making the mistake, it's about why that happened, uh, what can we do and our nurses have learned to say, well, I don't know, being humble. If you are not humble, you cannot learn. So this had been also a great way to say, gosh, you know, uh, our teams needed training, what were the areas, and we are working hard into that. So the, the ACE units, which I hope will be the ACE hospitals, um, are very intentional into uh, the environment. How many of you have been ever at the hospitalized? Okay, some. Um, do you remember when at the middle of the night somebody decided to clean the floor in the hall because they were behind their duties? How many times you're trying to fall asleep and then the nurses come across and everybody is laughing like a big party and you're in so much pain? 
Um, and then you get these ugly gowns that you get in the hospital and a pillow that is so uncomfortable and not even talking about the food, no asparagus. Actually, there is one hospital that gives you asparagus. Very expensive, by the way. And what I'm saying is giving you some examples of how hazards of hospitalization are a major issue in our hospitals. Well, the ACE unit is trying to rethink that by uh, being a nice place, pretty colors, warm. Uh, we have a detector for voices, so when the boys go too loud, say, you are talking too loud, please be quiet. Technology, right? We talk about technology, little traffic light. Uh -huh. um, we are more intentional that the caregiver comes and stay overnight. Another rethinking in the model, uh, asking the family to be your nurse, asking the family to be part of the team, asking them, you know your mom, you know when they are in pain, can you tell me when they're going to get up? Um, so even though we sometimes get difficult families, what we have learned is we have the same investment if they were be or loved ones there. So when a family is asking a lot of questions and wanted to, don't reject them, involve them. The more word you give them, the more they love it. And so or AZ and they have comfortable couches, as much as you can make the couches comfortable, I will say that, but they can stay at night and be part of the care. So again, all of these things are re, re, uh, engineering the way that we design hospitals and systems. There is a lot of protocols that don't need a doctor. You nurses love it. You don't need to call us. So we have a delirium protocol, it's in our admission orders. The, if the nurse has the opportunity that if the patient is developing delirium, you don't need to call to get the UA and the CDC. You can call us to say, I got this last week because the patient was, nobody's going to scream at you. We have a false prevention protocol. We have a, a, a sleep uh, protocol that tries to avoid hypnotics. We try to get as many sleep boxes as we can, tell the families to bring lavender music, bring their pillows, bring their pajamas, bring their pictures, um, talk to them from the housekeeper to the CEO all the cognitive, stimu cognitive stimulation. We have a restorative aid that uh, we have an easy street. I think we have a picture that looks like an easy street. You are walking and so you can retrain them to go to the grocery store, to go to the diner area. We have a car, we have a via trans. So the patient can be moved outside the room and play or do activities with other seniors. And if you didn't pee in your bed before you came to the hospital, why were we going to tell you to pee in a diaper? If you didn't eat breakfast in bed, why we need to tell you you need to eat breakfast? Those are concepts that, concepts that are radical. Because bed rest is a word that we do not use very often in our ACE unit. Even with our very bed bound elders, we train the family and the restorative aid to move them and do a couple of times passive rate of motion. So again, the concept of you're sick, don't move. No, let us get up even if it's five minutes. You know, you, are not, you need to get back and we motivate them and it's everybody's business to get them out. So this pretty unit, welcome to Torrey, just let us know you're coming so we can accommodate you. But the idea is that the team, the atmosphere, the, and it's a daily work. And we have a lot of problems, but we tackle them systematically. We're using more electronic medical, you need to tell me my time, Mark, because I need to be uh, uh, on our Dr. Parker's time too. Uh, we're using technology, so computerized systems that can generate information. So this is not our ACE tracker at the ACE, but it's the model that we use from Wisconsin, Dr. Michael Malones, or mentor in the ACE unit in, in Wisconsin. But the computerized system gives you the name of the patient, their age, length of stay, are they cognitively impaired, are they depressed, how many meds they have, do they have inappropriate medications, Morse score, falls, bedridden, consultation. And in a snapshot, you could see who are your high risk elders. This guy has 20 medications, is 89, failed, is not eating. That, those are the ones that we're going to target really aggressively versus somebody 65, two medications, very ambulatory. We do the same protocols, but you don't wait until the disaster comes. So technology allows you to have uh, a population management so you could make any teams on decisions very early on. 
We are still, that's one of our major challenges in the institution, working with a system that is not the best, uh, but we're develop our own version 101 and we're working on it. Um, so we will, Dr. Parker will talk more in detail on this. Um, there is plenty of data. These few slides are to tell you that geriatric assessments and the way that teams can work around to evaluate systematically all the older adults. So let me give you an example. If you have an older adult in, in our unit, um, we're going to check your cognition. So you bet that we're going to see if you have delirium, if you have a cognitive disorder. You bet that we're going to screen you for falls. We're going to be checking your skin integrity. You bet that we're going to be looking into your medications with a you know, 360 degree view. You bet that we're going to try to stop things that we don't think are useful. So they, we're very intentional about really provide geriatric concepts and all disciplines for good outcomes. Um, so we are still working with our teams and developing continuously quality improvement projects, um, selling to the institution the value so we have learned that if you don't measure and you don't put a dollar attached to it, it's really hard. But we have been able and successful to show that the program is beneficial. Um, recently, Dr. Uh, Bob Palmer and uh, his group, Sid Landfill, uh, published um, data that they have in the 90s. In the 90s, nobody cared about cost. So when they look into this, nobody really was looking into numbers. But now, uh, this article was published recently to show that uh, many of the ACEs due to the decreased length of stay, decreased readmission rate, the cost for an ACE patient can be between $1,000 to $1,000 less. Well, do that in a patient beds, and if you have an MBA and all of that, that's where you go back to your administration and say, can we expand this? So we're expanding the program. And we're bringing Nietzsche, which is the National Initiative for the Care of the Hospitalized Elders for Nurses. So we're going to train the entire hospital. It's like a magnet status, but for elderly care. When you do Nietzsche first, your ACE flows extremely easy. We did it backwards, but it's OK. Never late to correct it, so we are going to do it. OK, um, five more minutes, and then Dr. Parker will come and tell you more. But this is the study that they did with Dr. Lansville. 1632 patients, average age 70, medical war, and all of these were the results. Um, they have very old people, majority female. 84% came from home, 10% decreased long test stay. This is in the 90s. If you extrapolate that to a cost of a hospital today, it will be around $2,500 per patient because it's 1994. Um, this is a funny story. When people call me, they said, we like your shoes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, thank you. But uh, that's our team, our nurse practitioner, our nurse manager, Dr. Parker, myself. Um, that picture should have a, a million more people behind that have a heart for AIDS, including all of you. You are spending today an hour. So my challenge and invitation is you are part of this ACE model. We, wherever you go, you need to start some sort of model of care that can be similar. Thank you for your time, and Dr. Parker will walk us through the second part. Let us switch. Is that working? Yeah. All right. We're on. What a wonderful audience you guys are. Dr. Oakes has got you all warmed up for me. <laughs> She's a tough act to follow. Now, I don't talk quite as fast as she does, so. <laughs> Not that I'm a Texan. I'm originally from Kansas. <clears throat> I've only been here about 10 years. Uh, KU basketball, incidentally. Uh, seems to uh, always beat the Texas teams. <laughs> so, <laughs> not always. <laughs> yeah. I won't tell my Aggie jokes either. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to continue talking about our ACE unit. 
This is sort of an a inappropriate picture because in the background is our downtown uh, hospital, which is now the Children's Hospital. We're out at the one on Babcock, uh, Christus Medical Center. Now, as we move into the future with healthcare reform, we're moving finally from a value or volume-based system where we get paid for doing a lot of things to a lot of people in a very short period of time to a system where we get paid for doing the right thing for the right person at the right time, a value-based. We're going to go from volume to value. And the trick is going to be, how do you measure that value and what's it worth? Now, our current healthcare system that we're living in, since I went into medicine a long time ago, has evolved from an acute care episode-based type of program to a chronic care model. But we still have the infrastructure for the acute care model, and it doesn't work. All of you have experienced that. So this picture is a, uh, uh, a representation of an Indian uh, parable about the six blind men examining the elephant, and they each have a different impression. This one down here thinks that it's a snake. This blind man up here thinks this tusk is a spear. This uh, blind man thinks the ear is a fan. This guy thinks it's a column, a brick wall, a rope. Now imagine, if you will, that each of these are a doctor. This guy's obviously an ear, nose, and throat doctor. <laughs> Probably a dentist. This one may be uh, an otologist, clearly an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> dermatologist. And this guy, of course, must be a GI. <laughs> now, each of them have a different impression of who the elephant is. Who is this patient? They each see their own particular point of view and they each have a depth of knowledge about that particular organ. And they each are doing the right thing for that organ. The problem is, each and every one of them is not paying any attention to the other one. So the typical patient that we see in our acute care, in our ambulatory uh, unit, our clinic for geriatrics, is a patient that has, on average, five organ specialists. Typically, they'll have a diabetologist, a cardiologist, a urologist. They may have a, a pulmonologist. Certainly, they have a dermatologist down here in Texas. And they're all bringing in a sack full of pills. And they're brought in by their loved ones because they're not getting better. They're getting the best medical care from the smartest blind men in the world. But they're not getting any better. So you may have one doctor prescribing a drug that counteracts the medications that another doctor is prescribing. One may be prescribing a beta blocker, the other a beta agonist. One might be prescribing an anticholinergic drug that makes the patient more confused. Most of them do not recognize that this patient has mild dementia or even moderate dementia. So that's the provider level of complication. If we go on and look at what happens to the patient in the community? We have a hospital, we have nursing homes, urgent care centers, emergency departments, home health agencies, rehab hospitals, office clinics, and many others where patients receive care. And just like the six blind men, none of these institutions talk to each other. And the patients move between all of these, as we were talking about, transitions of care, no communication. So it's complicated even more. Patients moving with a sack full of pills and a whole bunch of specialists. All of you have experienced this with your family members in the past. Now, Medicare is trying to help us. They're very interested in moving to a value-based system because it's going to make our care more effective and more uh, efficient, let's say, and save them money, save our taxpayers money. It's been highly politicized 
we're going to see a lot of arguments in the debates coming up for the president's presidential debates about whether or not health care reform is going to improve our health care or not. But Medicare is already pretty far down the road. They're not going to pay for catheter-associated urinary tract infections, pressure ulcers that occur in a hospital stages uh, three and four. In hospital falls and trauma. You break your leg in the hospital, hospital has to eat that. Error embolism. Uh, unfortunately, that happens. Uh, blood incompatibility. Mediastinitis following cabbage. Surgical site infections and vascular catheter infections. Not all of these are in place yet, but they will be soon. And when they occur, it lengthens the hospital stay, poorer outcomes for our patient, and much more expenses for our hospital. So they're going to be looking real closely, your chief financial officer, at uh, what your length of stay is and what your complication rate is. So why does the ACE model work? And does it work? Is it cost effective? I think the important thing about the ACE unit is it focuses on the patient and the family. You should have family in there. It's very important. And family is a loose term. We have uh, all sorts of families. Some people just live together without the benefit of matrimony. Some people are closer to their stepkids than they are to their own kids. Uh, there are gay partners. We have quite a few of those here in San Antonio and in our practice. So you need to work with the extended family that's going to be the caregiver. And we're interested in their functional status. What can they do now? Can they feed themselves, dress themselves? Can they manage their money? Can they drive a car? What was their baseline level? So when we come, they come in the hospital, we'll know, is there a chance to get them back to that level? Now, somebody that wasn't able to walk before, obviously, we're not going to be able to get them back to walking again. So the entire team, from the housekeeper to the therapist to nurses, are empowered to intervene for the patient. We try to train them to recognize change in condition. The earlier we can recognize that, the sooner we can do something about it and prevent the escalation. So we want the housekeeper to say, well, Mrs. Jones trying to get out of bed again, or she's seeing stuff on the wall, or she's screaming and yelling. We need that kind of feedback. Each team member understands what the patient goals are, and just like Dr. Oakes was talking about, by having these daily team meetings that are led uh, really by the nurses, we all are on the same page about what the patient's plans are, what their objectives are, what, is, what are we really trying to accomplish here. So it's a continuous learning system. And the whole time we're focusing on the transition of care. Where is that patient going to go next? And are they going to have the information they need at that next level of care to continue the quality of care that the patient's getting now? We don't want to regress. Patients get sick quick, they get well slow. It takes a long time to get them back to where they were. We don't want to lose any ground. So think of our ACE unit, or any nursing unit really, as a portfolio of quality improvement programs. And I'll just mention a few of them briefly here. The direct admission program is where we try to bypass the emergency room. Uh, and, and as Lily was saying, it's no fun being in the emergency room, especially if you're old, because we don't talk too good, we don't remember our medications, we lay on a gurney and stare at fluorescent lights, then we get delirious, and then we have a tough time in the CT scanner that everybody gets when they come in the emergency room. So if you weren't uh, ready for a hospital admission or qualified for hospital admission when you came in, you will be after laying in the emergency room unattended for 10 hours. Actually, I think the average is only four to six hours, somewhere in there. But if we can bypass that emergency room, we can get treatment started earlier. So we'd like to take the patients that are relatively stable, put them in a hospital bed, and get our work up and our treatment started immediately. 
Discharge process starts as soon as the patient's admitted. The next day at the team meeting, we're looking at our goals and objectives. Where is this patient going to go? Case manager may be talking to uh, skilled nursing facilities the same day. Fall prevention program. We'll mention that a little bit more later. And Ted has worked a great deal on preventing falls in our unit. Uh, we are a restraint-free unit. We uh, don't use Foley's unless we absolutely have to. There are very few indications for a Foley catheter anymore. They frequently cause infections and repeated hospitalizations. Um, probably the, the primary reason to keep them in is for bladder outlet obstruction from prostate disease or whatever indication. Uh, or if you really need to know what the urine output is in an intensive care situation. Delirium prevention. Let your patients sleep. Keep them oriented. Keep them off the drugs that make them crazy. Treat their pain. Pressure ulcer prevention. When we opened this unit, uh, we got some special beds that uh, have a pressure-reducing mattress. They're $10,000 a piece. And uh, I know they're good because all the patients ask if they could buy one of those somewhere. <laughs> For $10,000, they say, mm, oh, I'll stick with my number mattress. <laughs> so if you told me that this was going to happen when we started, I wouldn't have believed it. But we have not in two years, in 2,000 admissions, had a single pressure ulcer acquired in our facility. Not even a stage one. I don't think it's the mattresses. I think it's our restorative aide who gets them out of bed and drags them around the hospital. This woman is wonderful. And if, if she ever gets sick, we're in trouble. So we want to take really good care of her. But I think moving all of our work closer to the patient, moving the computers closer to the patient, moving our aides to the patient, hourly rounding, getting back to the bedside is really what makes the difference. And we don't let our patients stay in bed. They get up for meals, too. They move. We have uh, an extensive training program for our nurses and uh, our aides. We involve the families in care planning as soon as they arrive. Sometimes it takes a little training because families aren't used to talking to doctors and teams about the plan. And often they're hard to find. They have to work, too. So you really have to spend some effort getting the family involved. If this is a chronic problem, we're going to get palliative care involved early. If it is a problem that's going to uh, result in death eventually, we may invite hospice to start talking with the family early. There's no obligation, of course, but you want to know what hospice has got to offer. We have, we, we try to measure patient and family satisfaction. It's difficult. Our hospital's using press gaining, which I'm not very happy with. But demented people don't return mail surveys. When you mail the survey to their home, they, they just don't return them. I think we get one or two every couple months. We're working to measure the cost, and sometimes we have to uh, work with our CFO to try and figure out what the direct cost is. Uh, hospitals mark everything up so much, it's far beyond their real cost level, so it's often difficult. Uh, Interact, we're going to talk about a little later. This is a program to prevent uh, hospital readmissions and unnecessary transfers to the emergency department. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Press Ganey will not allow you to give that to him directly. It has to go in the mail. Press Ganey, is everybody familiar with Press Ganey? It's a uh, service that hospitals contract with nationwide to measure patient satisfaction. They think that we can stack the deck, you know. Here, fill this out while I'm standing right here. Our car dealers do that, you know. Did you like your service today? You didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me fill it out for you. I think there's a better way 
but, and we wanted to send out our own survey to the families, and we are not even allowed to do that. So I'm not real happy with press gaining. Uh, we don't use physical restraints. Uh, we're continuously tweaking our protocols. We have a, the injury prevention program with our fall reduction program. As you'll find out, uh, it, I don't know if it was mentioned in your talk, uh, Ted, that uh, Dr. Sa has done a magnificent job with this. With his, uh, he, he took a, a clinical safety and effectiveness course, and they teach us how to do quality improvement in a systematic manner. And he chose fall reduction for his project. And when he did that, I thought he was crazy because I don't think you can really prevent falls. It's an accident, right? Well, he did. <laughs> and I'll show you how he did it later in our next talk. But he went to the team and they brainstormed all these ideas and they tried a bunch of different interventions. And we actually went 181 days, was it, without a fall in this unit. I, yeah, you could have knocked me over. But uh, beyond that, we haven't had a single injury fall. Not one fall has resulted in an injury. So that's saving the hospital a lot of hip fractures, saving the patient a lot of injuries and subdural hematomas. We do an initial cognitive evaluation on each patient. Families are often surprised when they find out their loved one's really kind of demented. We thought she was just, you know, retired. <laughs> if they do have a Foley, and a lot of our patients come back from surgery with a Foley, we look immediately, why do they have a Foley and review it? Every day we look at that med list, our PharmD scans it, She's sort of in competition with us to find ways we've screwed up, <laughs> and she does, and we educate each other. We have some heated discussions, not arguments. We don't call each other stupid. We just let each other learn. <laughs> I think that's one of the benefits of having a nurse-led uh, group when everybody really is empowered. I mean, I remember back in the days when I graduated from medical school, doctors were a big deal. You know, a doctor would walk on the floor and the nurses stood up. They wore white uniforms and little hats. They'd light your cigarette even. <laughs> and, no, they really did. They were smoking it. Yeah, you guys are too young. You don't know that. You were allowed to smoke in the hospital. The VA hospitals had cigarette machines in them. You could buy cigarettes for 25 cents a pack at every VA hospital in the country and you could smoke in your room, in your bed. <laughs> so things have changed now. I remember we used to talk about neurosurgeons uh, because they, have, they were kind of proud of themselves. We used to say there, but for the grace of God goes God. <laughs> and now we've, we've got a, a system where we're more approachable. You know, it's okay for a nurse or an aide to come up and say, what in the heck are you doing? Why are you doing this? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, yeah, I didn't know it. Did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> we use a caseworker extensively. Uh, no hospitalized acquired pressure ulcers, as I mentioned. Isn't that amazing? Um, <coughs> you want to know about what? Oh, beers. It's not the one that you drink. <laughs> Dr. Beers, in I think it was 1994, had a uh, group of experts get together. They came up with a consensus panel and decided which drugs weren't really good for old people. So drugs that are on the beers list, we don't use. Benadryl is one of them, it's an anticholinergic drug, causes dry mouth, constipation, and delirium. I remember when I was in private practice, uh, a not uncommon situation would be a call from the emergency room. Grandpa was in there with a bladder the size of a basketball and he couldn't pee for the last three days. Grandma was treating his cold with Benadryl. 
and he got bladder outlet obstruction from the anticholinergic properties of Benadryl. And a lot of drugs we use over the counter, particularly the sleep aids, have Benadryl in it. And our patients take them. Demerol is a, used to be a very popular drug. Some of the hospitals have eliminated it from the formulary. It has a metabolite called normaparidine that has a half-life of 16 hours. And if you give this drug on a steady basis, scheduled, that drug will accumulate and can cause grand mal convulsion. So we try not to use it. Or if we use it, we only use it once, or very rarely. Uh, I wanted to, yeah, we got a little bit of time left. I wanted to talk a little bit about this palliative care and hospice uh, services, because it's a program that our uh, ethicist is uh, doing, not in our hospital, but in another, where he comes in and talks with families of patients that are recently admitted to the intensive care unit. And he sits down with them and asks them, what are your expectations? What do you think is going to happen? What do you want to happen? What's been the lifestyle and quality of life of your loved one up to this point? So we're really talking about end of life care. And is this patient somebody that really should have an all out medical intervention? that the intensivist will do. Now, intensivists can do a lot of technology. They can keep us alive for weeks and weeks and weeks, as you all know. And they know how to do it, and they do it. That's what they get paid for. And families don't know that we have a choice. So many of them will tell him, gosh, we would really like to just give her a, a graceful and dignified death. You know, she's been suffering for a year. So they'll go talk to the hospitalists, and the hospitalists sometimes will argue with them. Oh, we can, get, we, can, we can fix that one, or we could fix this other problem. We can fix the anemia. We can fix that pneumonia. But eventually they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, long-term-wise, it's not going to make any difference. This patient is really in actively dying. And he's decreased the census in the ICU at this hospital substantially. Now, I don't think the hospital chief financial officer is going to be real happy about that. But what a wonderful intervention. And I, I, you know, I hope that he will continue this and that we can implement it in our institution, too. Family meetings, same thing. We do the same thing in our group at the ACE unit, uh, have family meetings. We try to keep our patients out of the ICU uh, just for that very reason. Uh, there are times when it is appropriate. Uh, we use the all, a lot of technology, but it's not the technology that works the magic. The magic occurs in those meetings, the interdisciplinary meetings where everybody talks together, just for a half hour over each patient. And I think a lot of our administrators think that's a waste of time because you have a lot of salary sitting in there for a half hour doing nothing. And I tell them, you can't afford not to do it, because <laughs> look at the outcomes you're getting. It's saving you money. It's saving patients grief, misery, and saving lives. We're still working on uh, a volunteer program, and I would like to get community members, family members eventually involved in volunteering in this unit. We have weekly educational meetings for our team. Uh, most people, like me, have an attention span of about five to 10 minutes. And so we pick out one little thing to teach, and we teach that five to 10 minutes, have a short discussion. Uh, we have a national telephone conference with uh, Mike Malone in Milwaukee, uh, Mayo Clinic, University of Missouri. Several other major universities are involved in in this telephone conference, we, ha we take turns. We'll present a case that's been extremely difficult for us to manage. Maybe a social complication or a medical complication. Everybody participates in that. We exchange ideas from it. Very well received. Started out with just two or three institutions. I don't know how many people are using it now. Lily, do you know? 
<laughs> yeah. And it's just an hour thing. So we got it all over the country. Uh, I think we've talked about a lot of this. Communication, communication, communication. Uh, medication screw-ups. Olders are complex. Uh, continuity of care, transitions of care, our government, the AHRQ is uh, looking very closely at transitions of care. Uh, they see that as a, as a, a big source of medical screw-ups and expense. Um, one study, the Eric Coleman study, showed that direct communication between a hospitalist and a PCP only occurs about 3 to 20 percent of cases, probably only 3 percent. Availability of discharge summaries at the first post-op discharge visit was very low, uh, 12 to 34 uh, percent. We use a standardized template. Oh, this is something I'm kind of proud of, and it's still very difficult to implement. Uh, we need to use a checklist as we discharge people, just like we use a checklist for admissions. We use a standardized template. It's an electronic version. A lot of it's pre-populated so that you have to put it in. Like it says name. Well, you've got to put the name there. Date of birth. Oh, yeah, I better put the date of birth in there, too. Um, then we email the discharge or fax it to the receiving institution. And if they're willing, we'll talk to them on the phone. And we keep a list of the facilities, their fax and emails number, uh, number around to do that. But this discharge summary has all the information that they're going to need to take care of this patient. What happened in the hospital? What meds are you going home on? What's our treatment plan? It takes a lot of work with the long-term care facilities to get them to do this. We'll fax it over there or email it to them. Then they'll call me about two hours later, usually about midnight. Oh, we got this patient here and we don't have any discharge summary. Oh, well, why don't you go look on your fax machine? Oh, there it is. So we also work with the families. They get a copy of the discharge summary. The staff will explain it to them. Uh, continuous communication with them and the receiving institution. Interact 2 we're going to talk about next. And we notify the primary physician promptly upon discharge. And we try to get the patient an appointment within a week or less with the receiving physician if they're going to be going home. Where do our patients come from? Um, primary physicians, about 30%. Nursing homes, 40%. Uh, home health agencies refer us quite a few. And, and our hospitalists. This graph shows what percentage of each category is actually a direct admission. So the home health agencies, virtually all of those are direct admissions. 80% of our outpatients are direct admissions. From long-term care, 90% are direct admission. They bypass that emergency room. So we've had about 2,000 discharges. Average length of stay, 3.6 days. Readmission rate for the same diagnosis, 3.4% nationally. That's about uh, 12 to 14%. That's making my hospital a lot of money. And they don't give me any of it. <laughs> yeah. I could hire another geriatrician. Our hospital is average about a day longer for hospital stay. Uh, like I said, patient satisfaction is hard to, high, is hard to measure. Uh, we have the lowest fall rate in the Christus system. No hospital pressure ulcers. Lots, lots of projects here. What is their readmission rate for the same diagnosis? Our readmission rate of the hospitalists, they're around 12%. 12, 14%. They're right up there with the rest of us. And, and you can understand that. Uh, I've watched my hospitalists round before I insult anybody. Anybody a hospitalist in here? <laughs> okay, we can talk about them. Uh, they'll have a list of 30 patients. They get paid by how many patients they see. How can you take care of 30 complex, seriously ill elders 
because most of these are elders, and round on them each day. Can't do it. So many of them actually go home without ever having their initial admitting problem addressed. And you see it time and time again. And the hospitalists are just like mad hatters running around the hospital. <laughs> Boom. Uh, the ACE is a model of quality, but like Lily was saying, we, ought, we need to be able to push this out to the other hospital floors. It should be used everywhere that we take care of patients, whether it's a nursing home, a hospital, or in our office. But we need a stable team with common aims. Uh, we need to develop this culture of quality and the quality process, which I think we've done at our hospital because we have a lot of uh, people coming up with ideas about how to improve things. One of the, we monitor the clinical and financial outcomes, and I think that's important because you need to be able to go to your board of directors and show them, look, we got better results than brand X, and we're getting, you're getting paid more, we're not. Actually, we get paid better if we keep you in longer and standardize our protocols. Po uh, that's a little bit of a typo there, I apologize. <laughs> we post our quality indicators in public. <laughs> Got your attention. Uh, it was an accident. Subliminal, maybe. So. Uh, this is what some institutions are using this. Uh, for instance, they would put up on their wall uh, where everybody can see, including the families and the patients, when the last time a patient fell was. And the staff sees that. And then when that number drops from 180 to zero, it, it, it's like somebody died. You know, it's a, it's a tragedy. And we all pick up and start over again. Infection rates, we ought to be posting those in public. People need to know this stuff. Um, Short-term aims, I think we've, we've talked about that. Uh, we'd like to expand this concept. The electronic geriatrician is kind of an idea that they're using in Milwaukee where they meet uh, by video conferencing with uh, other sites and they do the same thing that we do in these interdisciplinary team meetings, only they use video conferencing and it works for them. Works great. Do I, do I have a little more time? Or do you want to go on? Okay. I got the next talk. Okay. So next, you guys are going to get just as tired of me. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, I do. Wow. Yes. Uh, it, it is a little higher than on the uh, regular unit. Uh, what, Lily, do you know the exact ratio, four to one, or? Uh, for the CNA ratios, for staffing. Mm -hmm. I think we got an extra CNA. I think we do. Our unit has 16 beds, and, uh, to, you know, and, and we'd like to ex expand that too because it's full right now. And I'm going to tell you that the next speaker is over there working in our ACE unit right now, and that's why she's not going to be able to speak is because we have a full unit. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the uh, bundled payment programs. This is something that uh, Medicare has come up with. There, it's a new uh, project for saving the healthcare system and improving money and, save, and improving quality at the same time. And Dr. Sa and I worked with uh, the executives at Christus Hospital to submit a bundled payment program for hip fractures. And we chose hip fractures because it's something that's easily defined. Everybody knows it's either broken or not, most of the time. Sometimes you have to argue with the radiologist. Uh, but we do know that we can make a big difference with this because we have a lot of studies that show that early surgery improves outcomes in terms of functional status, uh, mortality, infection, just about every complication you can look at. Yet there is no pressure to operate early. If you break your hip on Friday night, it's going to be fixed on Monday. 
you're screwed. Well, we can change that. You can pay those orthopedic surgeons more to come in on Saturday. Try and find an orthopedic surgeon on Saturday. <laughs> Limit the number of prostheses. We're going to have, you know, there's 20 different hip prostheses you can use. If we can all agree on using the same two or three, we can limit the expense in terms of uh, equipment, prosthesis. Standardize the post-operative care. Standardization is the soul, I think, of quality improvement. You want to stabilize that process so you can tell what's random variation and what's, nor what's not. And we take good care of our patients, so if we could do this in the ACE unit, why can't we do it in the post-op unit? So we had 100 and 153 hip fractures in the Christus system in the three hospitals in San Antonio in the last fiscal year. And if we could implement this program, we estimate that we could save about 40% right off the top. And with the bundled payment program, we get to share that with Medicare. Now, if we don't succeed, they get to keep, they, they've, they, we only get 95% of what Medicare would have ordinarily paid us. In other words, there's a 5% penalty for failure, which is substantial since hospital margins are so small anyway. Or at least that's what they tell me. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Interact 2 in the next uh, talk, but I wanted to show you, let's see, this is uh, one of our beds in the, in the unit. I wanted to just show you a brief sample of Dr. Uh, Ted Suh's project on uh, uh, hip fracture, I mean on fall reduction. And his goal, his aim was to reduce the fall rate in our unit by seven falls per thousand bed days to three falls per thousand bed days. And he used this cause and effect diagram where his team got together and sorted all the causes into gait disturbance, incontinence, mechanical, distractors, staff, time of fall, medications, and mental status. And then each of these has a list of possible causes. So they target the ones that are they think will make the biggest difference, the so-called leverage points. And they use the Morse scale to identify the patients that are at high risk. They developed a flow map after the fall occurrence. And here's their process control chart. This is a very short uh, period of time. But you can see we were all over the place here. This is the upper control limit, the lower control limit. Anything that's above or below these control limits is uh, outside of normal variation. But this is an unstable process. And you can see how it jumps all around here. What you can't see is after his intervention, there's his fall rate. Zero. <laughs> Any questions on what we've covered? <laughs> I'm going to be on the floor here. <laughs> it looks pretty solid. <laughs> uh, yes, if they're over, uh, if they're frail and elderly and have chronic conditions, if we have a bed available, we'll be glad to have them. Uh, you're from a long-term care facility or home care. Home, home care? We would love to do that. We love working with home, uh, home health agencies. Um, I'd like to expand our unit, and they're talking about doing that. Uh, we're talk you know, there aren't a whole lot of geriatricians, so we're talking about training our hospitalists to do that. I would like to change the hospitalist model to a value-based system where they start getting rewarded for quality rather than volume. Yeah, and I think that we're moving in that direction, and then we could, we could let this uh, spread to the rest of the hospital. So are they evaluated in the emergency room to determine that? Or they no, you call us directly, and I give you Dr. TK's phone number. He and uh, you call him, and he lets us know, and then we, we arrange for a direct admission. You know, only the people that are actively 
dying or unstable, uh, having a heart attack or you know, vomiting or something that needs to be evaluated quickly will go to the emergency room. If people are just having a change in condition, those are the ones we want. Yes? Uh, not at this point. Uh, one thing I've learned about the uh, Catholic hospital system is they move very slowly <laughs> and cautiously. And maybe that's a good thing if you're an administrator, but if you're a person like me that wants to change the world, it ain't going to happen in, in, in my lifetime. <laughs> so you need, you know, we need to stir up some urgency for this. And uh, I think we need to do it on the ground floor at the, at the front line rather than top down. Our management doesn't understand what's happening to our healthcare system. They don't understand because they're still wearing the green eye shades and looking at the bottom line, which is what they need to do to keep in business. But the financial incentives are going to be rearranged, and they need to be ready for that. Right now, they're saying, oh, good, Dr. Parker has admitted a whole bunch more patients. Wow, he's a great doctor. Now, if I was a really good doctor, I wouldn't admit any. Yeah. That, the question is, what's a, how do we determine whether it's an observation admission or a, a hospital admission? And we do that upon admission, uh, and we spend a lot of time training our residents, house staff, and our other doctors about what is an observation patient and what's not. And that's kind of mysterious sometimes, because there's uh, sort of a fine line. But we, we use the criteria that Medicare has, and we do it right, at, right exactly upon admission. Now, that may change in 24 hours, and then they become a full admission. Does everybody understand observation status? No, yes? For, you mean the diagnostic uh, categories and stuff? Or, yeah, we have coders that we work with. We have uh, uh, admission folks that actually review. You know, if we if we admit somebody and we they'll come in and say, oh, that should have been an observation. Now you can't change it back, but we learn from that. Uh, it's kind of an artificial construct. Mm-hmm. Change it. Uh, uh, chest pain can be indigestion or a big heart attack. Uh, change in mental status is a common one that we have struggle with. Change in mental status is not a reason to admit somebody. I have a change in mental status several times a day. <laughs> but delirium is, or aggressive behavior. Uh, you just have to use the right words. And maybe this is kind of the crazy thing about uh, insurance companies and Medicare is we have to jump through all these hoops to get paid because ultimately it doesn't make any difference whether we use the term uh, delirium or change in mental status. Probably not. But we do need some precision in our diagnostic uh, criteria, which you all are going to see when we move to ICD-10. That's another disaster we can talk about some other time. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, talk, if you can. Mm -hmm.